So we are studying the book of Revelation because there is a rumor going around. There are those who are saying that the book of Revelation is but au oh, contraire say we, for you see, the word revelation itself means that something has been revealed. Absolutely. If God wanted to conceal something, he would have called it the consolation, not the revelation. And what is it that's revealed in this book? Well, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the opening line says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to find is that in this book, Jesus is revealed, not as we would uh, encounter him 2,000 years ago, but as we would encounter him today in his eternal glorified state. And God so wanted his people to take the time to read this book that he promised that for those who would take the time to read this book, they would receive a very special blessing. blessing. And that blessing is found in Revelation chapter verse, Revelation chapter one, verse three, the line, uh, Revelation one, three, it says, blessed is he who reads. And let me just say, this is the only time this phrase is mentioned in your Bible. Uh, this is the only book of the Bible that says, read me, I'm special. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, it's one prophecy, and heed the things which are in it, for the time is near. So it would be odd for us to believe in a God who says, I'll bless you if you read it. I want you to hear it. I want you to heed it. But here's the thing, you'll never understand it. It would be odd for us to believe in a God like that. But God knew that there'd be those going around saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. So to make this book understandable, God placed in this book its very own outline. And that outline is found in Revelation chapter, verse, you're getting it, you're getting it. Revelation chapter one, verse 19, this is the only book of the Bible that comes with its own outline. So Revelation chapter 119, John is told, therefore write the things which you have seen, that will be the first division, and the things which are, that will be the second division, and the things which shall take place after these things, and that will be the third division. So the first division, it says, therefore write the things which you have seen. So what is it that John has seen up to this point in the book of Revelation? Well, chapter 1, verse 13, just before this, it says, in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, and it goes to give a description of Jesus as we would encounter him now. That's the first division. But then it says, write the things which are the second division. Now, the things which are pertain to the time period that you and I would refer to as the church age, and that's found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches, and what we find is that in their order, these churches literally existed, what he writes about actually took place, but in their order, they will lay out 2,000 years of church history because the book of Revelation is one prophecy, not a series of prophecies. And so if you change the order of any of the churches, it makes absolutely no sense, but in their order, they lay out 2,000 years of church history. And uh, so we studied through that. But then he says, write the things which will take place after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after the church age. So the next time we will find that phrase, after these things, will be in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let's look at it. Everybody flip over to chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after chapters 2 and 3, the church age, it says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, and said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. As as I say every week, the Holy Spirit is so concerned to make sure that we don't miss that this is the third division in the book of Revelation, that he begins the verse with the phrase, after these things, and he ends the verse with the phrase, after these things. This is a picture of what you and I call the rapture of the church. John sees a door standing open in heaven, a voice like a trumpet, says, come up here, and immediately John is in heaven. He's there with the rest of the church, and uh, they are around the throne. And so we've been talking, and we've talked about that there in chapter four. So the church goes up. 
Now, one of the things that we find interesting is that although the word church will be mentioned over 20 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, from chapter 4, verse 1, uh, there's going to be one word that's going to be glaringly absent from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book, and that word is the word church. And the reason being is that the church is no longer here on the ground. We are in heaven. At the end of the book, in the closing paragraph, it says, Jesus says, I wanted to show these things to the churches, but we're n- you won't find that word church as far as being part of the story. Uh, so it's after the story. So the church goes up. So the church goes up. We saw that the church was around heaven when we are around the throne there in chapter four in heaven. And then in chapter five, there is this scroll and we found that it was the title deed to the earth. And there were seven seals. And as Jesus begins to open those seals, uh, all of a sudden, the event that you and I call the tribulation begins, and that's in chapter 6. So, chapter 4, verse 1, the church goes up, and the church goes up, we call that the rapture. When the church goes up, what comes down? Wrath. And that is found in Revelation chapter 6. Don't do this to me. Church goes up, what comes down? And that is found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. Let's look at it. Everybody turn over to chapter 6, verse 16. This is the opening of that time period called the tribulation. The church has been removed. And uh, this opening volley, and it says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. That's a reference to God the Father. And from the wrath of the... Lamb. And in the Bible, the lamb is always a reference to Jesus. They are surprised that it actually took place. Now, as you've heard me say many times, people are uncomfortable with God's wrath being poured out. We'll talk about that a little bit today, but always remember that before verse 16, there is verse 9. Everybody look at verse 9. And it says, the lamb broke the fifth seal, and I saw underneath the altar, this is in heaven, the souls of those who had been slain. They had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And so just as you are very passionate about your children, God is very passionate about his. And so some terrible things have been happening to his, and uh, now it's time, now it's time. So as we get into this today, the big question is always, what do you leave in and what do you leave out? So as, as we begin this today, what I want to say is that the purpose of the tribulation isn't so much to stick it to those who've been hurting God's people. And sometimes you can read that, you can get that sense. The, the purpose of the tribulation is to get man's attention, man who has been rejecting God. Now, in this time period of the tribulation, many will turn to the Lord, but most will not. So in the time period that you and I live in, which is called the church age, we can experience him in his love, forgiveness, mercy, and that's what he wants. He wants us to come to him in in this time period. But when the church goes up, what you find is God still wants people to come to him, uh, but grace and mercy didn't work, so he's going to try some different things. So there on your outline, uh, we're going to say the waves of wrath in the tribulation. uh, And and, uh, the first wave, which was in chapter 6, and you want to write this down, was man-made, was man-made. And uh, we saw that that the church has been removed. They didn't want God. They wanted a world leader. We call him the Antichrist. They receive him. They think it's going to create a utopia, but it creates war, famine, and death. And we saw that, about 25% of the earth. But they don't repent. They don't repent. So you get to the end of chapter 6, and it says, it says they cried out to the mountains and to the rocks. They're not crying out to God. And they don't say, Lord, save us. They say, hide us from the wrath. They don't come to him. Well, the tribulation, this tribulation period, gets progressively worse. So they they didn't come to the Lord in chapter 6 when they had the opportunity. They rejected So last week, we were in chapter 8, and we found that the second wave of wrath that came, we would call that celestial, and you want to write that down. And uh, we looked at a couple of verses. I'll just remind us of one. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star, and that word star is the word aster, 
for we also get the word aster, asteroid, right? And we talked about that last week. Blazing like a torch fell from the sky. But, but they didn't repent. He, he, they, they didn't repent when it was war. They didn't come to him. Uh, asteroids fall from the sky in all the cataclysm, but they don't turn to him. Well, the tribulation period gets progressively worse as they go. And today, what we're going to find is they didn't repent in chapter 6. They won't repent in chapter 8. And so by the time we get to chapter 9, uh, this third wave is going to be demonic. And you want to write that down. It's going to be openly demonic. It's going to be horrifying. And so I, I want to give you the punchline of what we're going to talk about today. Because when we, and, and just to kind of clarify this or to drive it home, in chapter 9, when we get to the end, in verse 21, here's going to be the result of everything that's happened so far. I put it there in your outline. They did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, or, nor their immorality, nor their thefts. That's going to be the end result of this. They just won't repent. And uh, we'll come back to this verse a little bit later on. So by the time we get to the end of this time period called the tribulation, in chapter 19, we're going to be in heaven, and, and uh, here's going to be the result. So everybody look at this on your outline. And it says, and after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. This is where we're going to be, crying out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are, his judgments are true and just. So these people when you know we're in heaven and we're going to cry out and we're going to say god your judgments are true and they are just these people you've done everything that you could possibly do to bring them to you and they have rejected at every at every point when when the church was here on the earth and you were giving love and mercy and grace and salvation they rejected that and so war in chapter 6, and they rejected you then. And then you get to chapter 8, and they reject. In chapter 9, they reject. And we're just about halfway, nearly halfway through the book of Revelation. It's continuous rejection. So at the end of that time, we'll look on and say, Lord, you did everything that you could possibly do, and they still reject it. Well, we'll talk about that as we go. We're going to pick it up in chapter 8. Did you find that at least interesting so far? So last week we left off, we went through chapter 8, I want to pick it up in verse 13 of chapter 8, and uh, this is where things are going to get really bad at this point. And uh, verse 13 it says, then I looked and heard an angel flying in mid-heaven, so, or uh, some of your Bibles will say eagle flying or angel flying, either way, in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. And we're going to find that this is the group, the earth dwellers, who will not who will not turn to him no matter what, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. So when it says, whoa, 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 you think it's bad so far? Now it's going to get really bad. Chapter 9, verse 1, then the fifth angel, and I've underlined fifth angel, sounded, and I saw a star, I've underlined that, from heaven, which, very important, had fallen, had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit, however your Bible says it, you want to underline that, was given to him. And you, you want to underline the word him. Going to be very important for our study today. So as we get into this, a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is going to be the fifth trumpet, and it's going to be the first woe. And we notice something in verse 1, and we underline it. It says, the star from heaven which had fallen. So you want to write down that this star had already fallen. So John doesn't see this star fall, it's fallen. When he sees it, it's already fallen. We're going to find that it fell thousands of years ago. Unlike the stars in chapter 8, this one's going to be a little bit different. Uh, the very last line, it says, uh, the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. Does everybody see that? You want to underline him. So this is going to be a little bit different because this star is a him, and you want to write that down. So again, John doesn't see this star falling, and this star is a him. Uh, this star, we're going to find, fell thousands of years before. So uh, we're going to know him as Satan, the devil, however you want to say it. In Isaiah, I put this on your outline, and here's how it says it. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations. 
But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like, I've underlined like, the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So Satan is going to be the star that has fallen. We'll see that as we go. He never says, I want to be God. He says, I want to be like God. I want, I want to be just, just like God. And here in verse 1, we notice that he has been given at this time the key to the bottomless pit. Now, he hasn't had the key to the bottomless pit for thousands of years. It's given to him here in chapter 9, verse 1, and we'll talk about that. That word, bottomless pit, I put there on your outline, is the word abusos, abusos. So some of your Bibles might use the word abyss, and, that, and that's, that's probably uh, more accurate. So abusos. So do you guys remember in the Gospels, there was the story of this man. He was called Legion because he had thousands of demons inside of him. And it's a story that's told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it, you know, someone, it's, it, it, it's uh, you know, he really wants us to know. And so this man who has the legion of demons inside of him comes to Jesus. And in Luke's gospel, he says it like this. And I put these verses on your outline. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God. He knows who he is. I beg you, do not torment me. So Luke tells it that way. Now, when Matthew tells the story, he adds a detail and he says, have you come here to torment us before the time? It's legion. There's thousands inside of this guy. So there's a certain time, and he wants to make sure that you haven't come to torment us before the time, have you? And then back to Luke, it says, and they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. And that word there is abuso, same word as here in uh, Revelation chapter 9. So these demonic uh, beings, these, these uh, demons, they recognize who Jesus is. They know their future, which is going to be in the abusos. And they don't want to go there. They don't want to go there because they know how horrifying it is in the abusos. And so, you know, they beg him to send them into the pigs, not into, into the abusos. And I, I say that because um, I have a relative who, before he became a Christian, he used to laugh and say, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell where all my friends are going to be, like you're going to be in a warm bar drinking beer or something like that. Uh, this is horrifying. The demons recognize how horrifying it is, and they don't want to go there. And trust me, if they don't want to go there, you don't want to go there. And so keep that in mind as we go. So later on in the book of Revelation, when we come to chapter 20, it's going to say this. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss or abusos. So Satan doesn't have the key for long. Keep that in mind. And a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss, the abusos and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. I've underlined that little part, deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. And then after these things, he must be released for a short time. So here, Satan only has the key to the abyss, the abusos, the bottomless pit for a very short period of time to open it up. And we'll talk about that. It's important to know that, that Satan is not the king of hell. He's a victim of hell. He's going to be thrown into hell. He's not there ruling. That's not his kingdom. So up to this point, it says that he has been deceiving the nations. For the last thousands of years, Satan has been deceiving the nations. And, uh, you know, when you and I look on as believers, we see things that would make absolutely no sense to us but they make perfect sense to the world, to, to non-believers. So for instance, if you go to the public school and you start handing out Bibles, they're, they're gonna stop you. You don't really want you to do that. But if you hand out condoms, they're okay with that. And this makes 
perfect sense. So dads, if your 16-year-old daughter goes to the school nurse and she needs an aspirin, they're going to say, well, we just can't give you an aspirin. We've got to have parental consent. We've got to make a phone call. We've got to check, make sure your parents are okay with it. So they've got to call you. Can't just give it to her. But if she goes and says, I want an abortion, nobody's going to call you. And this makes perfect sense to the world, but it makes no sense to you and I as believers. Does that make sense? So, so we think very different. So Satan has been deceiving. Well, that's going to end at a certain point. Well, here in verse 1, the key to the abusos is given to him. In verse 2, it says, he opened the bottomless pit and smoke went out of the pit like, I always underline the word like in, in Revelation, the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Uh, this bottomless pit, uh, typically um, in the ancients would teach that the bottomless pit would be at the center of the world because there's no bottom if you're at the center. Now, is that the, is that the case? I don't know, but that's, that's what they held. Verse 3, then out of the smoke came locusts. I've underlined that. Upon the earth, um, locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them as scorpions. I've underlined that of the earth have power. And they were told not to hurt the grass, I've underlined grass, nor any green thing, nor any green tree, but only the men, I've underlined this, the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted, I've underlined that, to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. There's a certain time. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. So these creatures come out. He's going to describe them as locusts, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Their sting is going to be like the sting of a scorpion. They can't hurt the grass. They can't hurt trees. They can only hurt men, people, who do not have the mark of God on, on their head. So that would be the 144,000 we talked about, and anybody who's become a believer during this time. So they can't kill anybody. They don't have permission. Five months. It's going to be a period of five months. And uh, I, I did look up how long does a scorpion sting. It stings for about three days. So, so this, it's going to be kind of like this perpetual thing. And what we're going to see is that here, Satan doesn't get to do what he wants to do. He wants to kill as many people as he possibly can before they make a decision for the Lord. So he's not allowed to kill anybody in this. He's only allowed to torment, to torment. Again, this is going to be so that people can say, maybe I need to come to the Lord. And we'll talk about that as, as we go. Verse 6, and in those days, men will seek death, and it will not, they will not find it. And they will long to die, and death flees from them. So they're going to conclude that it's better to die than to be stung by these things for five, five months. It is always a demonic lie uh, when somebody believes that it's better to die and leave this life thinking that they're going to a better place. The stinging of these scorpions is better than any place they would find in the afterlife apart from the Lord. Does that make sense? So this is as good as it gets. It's worse in that place. So keep, keep that in mind. So now we have a description. Verse 7 through 11. Pay attention to the word like. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. And so the idea is that he's describing things uh, in terminology that he has, and so he says it, it was like, I'm not saying it was, but it was like. Horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. Again, describing as best that he can what he's seeing. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. And they have tails like scorpions, and stings in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months, five months. So you see that emphasis there on, on five months. So what are these things? And, and there's various theories. Um, you, you notice that it describes them as they have hair that's kind of like a woman, and they have a face that's kind of like a man, and they have teeth that's 
kind of like a lion. So some theorize that this could be a picture of a modern housewife in the morning <laughs> before coffee and makeup. I'm not saying I hold to that, but I, I just put that out there. But if you were to study Bible prophecy back in like the 1960s or 1970s, one of the things that they would say is that, you know, it, it could be a helicopter. You know, because when you see the, the propellers going around, uh, the, you know, it looks like hair like a woman and the tail and, you know, and, and all of that. Um, that's probably not the case. And here, here's why. Um, first of all, these come out of the abyss. They can't hurt the grass or the trees. So that would be hard to say that's a helicopter. And they can only torment, not kill. And they can't hurt anybody who has God's mark on, on their head. So um, that, that would be, you know, that's probably not going to be the case. Another thing that we find in verse 11, it says they have a king over them of the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Now, Abaddon and Apollyon just means destroyer. So you want to write that down. His name is destroyer. And it's also interesting that these locusts, whatever they are, who come out of the abyss, they have a king. In the Old Testament and Proverbs there in your outline, it says the locusts have no king, yet all of them go out and rank. So whatever these are, they're, they're not locusts as we would understand them. So these locusts uh, are, are, are not literal locusts. They have this description. He's describing it as best that he can. I'm going to suggest that these locusts represent something demonic, and you want to write that down something demonic. Um, in verse 7, it says the appearance of the horses, uh, of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. So the idea is that when they come out, they're ready to go and they want to go do as much harm as they possibly can. But, but here's, here's the thing. When this happens, they didn't repent in, chap they didn't repent in chapter 6 when it was war, famine, and death. They, they didn't repent in chapter 8 when it was asteroid or stars falling from heaven, and they don't repent here, even though they are being tormented by this demonic army. Well, the tribulation gets progressively hmm. worse. I'm progressively having trouble worse. hearing you. So verse 12, it says, this, or the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. So after that five months, it's going to get even worse at that point. So this, this first army that comes out was a demonic army, and they could torment, but they couldn't kill, and people don't repent. So the, the next wave we're going to see is going to go just one step further. So we're going to pick it up in verses 13 and 14. It says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the... I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels, and I've underlined that, who are bound, underline the word bound, at the great river Euphrates. So what we're going to find here, and you want to write this down, is that released are four fallen angels who were bound, who were bound. The Bible talks about angels who did something that was so bad in God's eyes that he bound them up. What they did is a story for another day, but it caused the DNA of humans to be changed in such a way that they were no longer human. And so, and you read about that in Genesis chapter six. But in the book of Jude, it says this there in your outline. The angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And it so happens that they are in bond, they're in bounds at this place um, by the river Euphrates. And we'll talk about the river Euphrates as we get further into the book of Revelation. Verses 15 and 16, it says, and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would, and I've underlined, kill a third of mankind. The first wave could only torment. That didn't work. Now this 
is going to kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. And John says, I heard the number of them. Uh, John is shocked when he hears that, 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 that whatever this is, it's going to be 200 million. Now, if you were looking at the book of Revelation back, say, in 150 A.D. or, you know, shortly after it was written in 95 A.D.-ish, right, right in that time period, um, at the time of Jesus, there were only about 80 to 100 million people on the planet. And so to talk of an army that would have 200 million would be unfathomable. So you can see why people would consider the book of Revelation uh, allegorical, spiritual, but they said there's no way that could literally happen. If you held that this army was human, but I, I don't hold that. This is part of the woe, woe, woe. And things have become very different at this time period. So this second army, and you want to write this down, appears to be a greater de demonic army, a greater demonic army. If, if it were a human army, and we saw that in chapter 6, men would be killing one another. But whatever this is, they're going out and they are all killing men together. That's what they're doing, but they're not killing each other. So the first demonic army could only torment. That didn't work. People didn't turn to the Lord. So this next wave, they're given the ability, the permission to kill a third of mankind. And so they go out. Verse 17 he says, this is how I saw in the vision. And uh, he, it's, it's as if he's saying, this is how it looked to me in the vision, and I'm going to describe it the best way that I can. The horses and those who sat on them, the riders, had breastplates. The color of, the color of fire and of hyacinth and brimstone. Some of your Bibles would just say red, blue, and orange. And the heads of the horses are like, always under the word like in Revelation, the heads of lions. So these aren't horses as you would know them. And out of their mouths proceeds fire and smoke and brimstone. And a third of mankind was killed. So it's emphasizing that third of mankind. By these three plagues, and by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouth. For the power of the horses is in their mouths, mouths and their tails, and their tails are like serpents, not scorpions as we saw before, like serpents, and they have heads, and with them they do harm. So this is very different than that first wave, but they didn't repent back in chapter 6, and they didn't repent in, in this case, and, and, and it goes on. So verse 20, here's the result. It says, um, again, again, I hold that this is a, a, a second greater a demonic army. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and of stone or of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts, nor of their thefts. So, um, no matter what God does, they won't repent. They won't repent, and that's the, the picture. Some do, but, but most do not. But I put verse 21 on your outline on the front, and we read that. Would you flip over to the front of your outline? And I, I want to just highlight something, some words here. It says, they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries. And I want you to notice that the word there for sorceries is the word pharmakia. Does everybody see that? Pharmakia, from where we would get the English word pharmacy. And it involves drugs. In those days, sorcery was always attached to, you, uh, to drugs. If you were uh, casting a spell or doing something, uh, they would attach drugs to that to, to make that happen. So they just thought that that meant sorcery, but it, it's our, our word for, for drugs. And so it's very interesting to me because they would not repent of their pharmakia, 
uh, before I was a pastor, um, I worked as a drug counselor. And what I noticed as a drug counselor, when you read the statistics, you and I live in a generation where substance abuse is out of control unlike any other generation in history. Unlike any other generation in history. It, it, it's just out of unbelievable. And you and I live in that one generation where that's taking place. A you know, hundred years ago, they didn't have rehab centers all over the place. You and I live in that generation where that takes place. And then it says, they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, pharmakia, nor of their immorality, and that word there's pornea, from where we get the English word pornography, yes. Now, we say pornography, but pornea just uh, involves any type of sexual sin at all. It's just anything outside of what God has established. You and I live in the only generation, in the only generation where we have people who come to church, they're not married, but they're living together. They're not married, but they, they live together. A hundred years ago, nobody would be living with somebody that they weren't married to, and if they were, they wouldn't be coming to church. You and I live in the only generation in church history in 2,000 years where people openly live together, don't get married, and they go to church as though everything's okay. Did you know that? Why do you look guilty? I'm not. <laughs> I'm just saying it's a statistic. So, so, so that's very interesting because that never happened 100 years ago. But then it says, they did not repent of their murders. And you want to underline that. Now, that's fascinating because there has never been a society um, that al allows people to murder people. There, I mean, there's no society where you can just go kill your next door neighbor and it's, it's okay, you know. There, there's no society like that. But is there a form of murder that is legal? Is there a form of murder that is legal, acceptable, and even encouraged, and in many times even celebrated. And that form would be abortion. abortion, absolutely. Now, if you've had an abortion, there's forgiveness, there's restoration. I'm not saying, you know, you did this, that's not the point. We need to repent, but they won't repent of that. They won't repent. So there, there is repentance. There, there's forgiveness. There's restoration. So that's, you know, just so you know that. Guys, you and I live in the only generation in 2,000 years where it's acceptable, it's legal, it's encouraged, and it's celebrated to have abortion or to kill, and, and, and society is perfectly okay with that. We live in the only, only generation, only generation. My, my point in telling, again, if that's you, there's forgiveness. God wants to forgive. That's the whole point of everything that we, we talk about. He's trying to get the people in this tribulation period to come to him and receive that forgiveness. But my point in saying this is that we live in the only generation where these things happen. And uh, we are so close we are so close to the next phase. The next event is going to be the rapture of the church. And there are things that are happening right here, now, in our generation, even in the church, that we are, we are right there. Does that make sense? And uh, so, I, um, so we're, we're right there. We're right there. It's actually happening. This has never happened in any other, other generation. So with that, as we close in prayer today, if you're here and you don't know, if you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you have received his forgiveness, that you are saved, that you're going to be part of chapter 4, verse 1, when you hear the call, come up here. 
Uh, you, you want to settle that today. And so as I close in prayer, you have the opportunity to say, I want that. I want to be the guy in chapter 4, verse 1, that when I hear your call, I, I'm there. Because you don't want to be here in chapter 6 or 8 or 9, and we're just getting warmed up. We're just getting warmed up. So as we, we pray, if that's you, invite Jesus into your life right now. Let's pray. Father, as we close this time and we realize that, Lord, things are happening right now that have never happened, never happened, uh, especially not in church world, uh, and we realize that we are very close and it's happening just as you said it would, and we're catching glimpses, and we realize that the events of that time period of the tribulation are so close that they're literally casting their shadow on this time period. Father, for those of us who've never settled who we belong to, we just look to you and we say, Jesus, come into my life. Give me your forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me of everything. I want to belong to you. I want to be yours. And I'm inviting you in. And he promises that when you invite him in, the Jesus of the Bible, that he steps in and he never leaves, which is why you'll never meet somebody who has walked with the Lord for years who ever regrets making that decision. And so we receive you right now. Father, I thank you for this congregation, their love for you, their love for the things of you, their love for your word, even this chapter and this book. And uh, we thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives. We want you to do things in us and through us that cause us to be effective for you in this time and place where you've called us to be. I pray, God, that you keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Did you find that interesting today? Good, good. Love you guys.